Hello, crime historians, and welcome back to episode 14 of a crime story podcast. I'm your host, Kaylin Lois, and I am a law student here in France, but I am originally from the United States. And when I moved to France, I started hearing these insane crime stories um, that aren't often covered in the American media, so I created a crime story podcast to tell you all about it. So without further ado, let's just hop into today's crime story. Today we venture into New Zealand for our crime story. As always, let's begin with the legal system. In New Zealand, a country whose law grounds itself, like America, in English common law. But unlike the USA, New Zealand has a constitutional monarchy and parliamentary democracy. It revolves around these three integrated principles, parliamentary sovereignty, the rule of law, and separation of powers. The judiciary system remains independent, non-corrupt, but not always non-biased. New Zealand lies in the southwestern Pacific Ocean, and around 5 million residents reside there today. Known for its beautiful landscapes, sheep, and progressive politics, the country has three official languages, English, Maori, and New Zealand Sign Language. In 1993, New Zealand became the first country to allow women to vote, which I just thought was a really cool fact to put into the episode. Today's crime story comes in as New Zealand's biggest, most expensive, and most controversial investigations. The story takes place in Marlboro, Sounds a network of sea drowned valleys at the northern end of the South Island of New Zealand. In Morbow Sounds, to ring in the new year, only one place, the Ferno Lodge in Endeavour Inlet, fits the bill. Only accessible by water, the 100 year old building has hosted legendary parties. Our first primary character, Ben Smart, a 21 year old civil engineer, who loved music and played the guitar and was just generally known to be a really good guy. Our second primary character, Olivia Hope, who was 17, had recently received admission to the University of Otago with hopes of pursuing a law degree. Olivia was known for her intelligence, ability to play piano, and was head perfect at her school in 1997. Her father, George Hope, a local politician, described his daughter as a realistic young woman with a strong inner strength. Ben and Olivia grew up in the same town and knew each other and considered each other to be good friends. I don't know how close they were. There was obviously a four-year age difference, and we don't really know if they liked each other or if any had romantic feelings towards each other, but in all the articles and all the research I did, it just said that they were longtime friends. Anywho, Olivia Hope left her parents' Grovetown Marlboro home on the 30th of December to go to Wetamonga Bay, where she boarded a chartered yacht, the Tamarack. Her sister and seven other friends joined her. The next day, the yacht picked up three additional people, and they headed towards the Ferno Lodge to ring in the new year. As estimated, anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 people had attended this New Year's bash. Meanwhile, Ben Smart arrived with a group of friends and had plans to sleep in a nearby beach shack, but I don't really know what happened to those plans. But anyway, at some point, Ben and Olivia had met up and ended up going back to the yacht where they planned to sleep, the Tamarack. They took a water taxi driven by one Guy Wallace to get them from the lodge to the Tamarack, but upon arrival, they found like 12 people who were already asleep on the boat, and there was just no room for them to sleep. So they returned to the water taxi to try to figure out like what they were going to do next. Ben and Olivia were not alone with Guy Wallace on the water taxi. In fact, three other passengers rode with them. One Hayden Morsey, Sarah Dyer, and another man. Now, according to Guy Wallace, the water taxi driver, Ben and Olivia asked to go back to a shore, but an unnamed man. But the other passenger, the other man, offered them beds aboard his yacht. They accepted. 
Wallace described the mystery man as having dark wavy hair with an unshaven face and was very, very drunk. He dropped the threesome off and stated that they boarded a 12-meter wooden two-masted catch painted white with a blue stripe and round portholes. The boat was tied among 160 or so other vessels also there in Endeavor Inlet for the party. This becomes the last time anyone sees Olivia Hope and Ben Smart. Concerned that Olivia did not rejoin the Tamarack on New Year's Day, her parents became concerned and reported her missing on January 2nd. Ben's parents also reported him missing and the investigation ensued. Codenamed Operation Tam, short for Tamarick, the police quickly located Guy Wallace and recounted his story from his interaction. The Picton Police Force initiated a coordinated search for Ben and Olivia on January 3rd as concern mounted. Belham Area Controller Inspector Steve Caldwell took charge. The inspector asked commercial fishermen, boating clubs, and waterside lounges to keep an eye out for the catch and even asked the Air Force and Navy to do the same. The media speculated that the authorities would upgrade the missing persons case to a homicide investigation. When the investigation shifted, Inspector Caldwell later explained that this change meant that he could bring in additional resources for the investigation. Focus remained on identifying the two-masted yacht Ben and Olivia boarded per Guy Wallace. Police also asked citizens for pictures taken at Ferna Lodge and Endeavor Inlet to help track their movement. The public complied and police received pictures in droves. The police also searched the Endeavor Inlet seabed. On January 8th, the National Search and Rescue Center in Lower Hutt estimated the mystery yacht could have reached Australia or either end of New Zealand. Detector and spectator Ron Pope entered the case, confirming it as a homicide case because this is the role of detective and spectators in New Zealand. The police started to doubt the accuracy of the catch described by Guy Wallace. Ron Pope told the media that the police remained convinced that the catch existed, but said that they found no photographic evidence among all the photos collected from the partygoers of a boat matching the description. Police developed a montage of photos of boats moored off of Ferno Lodge. They issued a artist impression of the suspect's catch, showing two masts, a white hole with blue trim, and between five and seven round brass framed portholes. The detailed rendering described hundreds of yachts, and this was a fact that the police readily admitted. And also, if you want to see a sketch of this catch, go look at my Instagram. Within days, the police had provided the sketch to Interpol as well as portmasters in the South Pacific and Australia. 44 detectives now worked on the case, making it one of the largest in the history of New Zealand. A man named Ted Walsh reported a sighting. He stated to the authorities, quote, As he anchored off the Cannibal Cove on January 2nd, he saw a catch pass by heading for the open sea. It was under motor with no sails. What was distinctive was a young, blonde-headed girl sitting in the cockpit at the back of the boat and a guy with very short hair sitting beside her very close at the time of the sighting the two had been reported missing but mr wash certainly would not know about it the event registered in his mind because the two sitting so close together seemed strange and they did not return the waves from him and his passengers, a move uncharacteristic of Bodie's. He told the newspaper that there was no way he could say for certain that the two people that he saw were Ben and Olivia, 
Nevertheless, most people throughout New Zealand thought that he had. The police kept searching the waters near Endeavour Inlet for the next couple of weeks, and the two families organized private searches. On January 23rd, Olivia's father told the press that his and the Smart family refused to give up hope that the pair were still alive, despite the police confiding to them that they were looking for bodies. He said the police had advised that over a week to expect the worst, and he also asked the media and the public to have confidence in the police in the investigation. By February 20th, 1998, Operation TAM exceeded $1 million spent. In early March, Detective Pope stated that the mystery catch did not exist and that the investigation would focus on a sloop, which is a different kind of boat. Detective Pope said witnesses convinced that they saw the catch might have been confused in the wee hours of the morning after partying. Police tested these accounts against relevant established facts and became clear through some interviews that they were genuinely mistaken. Water taxi driver Guy Wallace, who took the trio to the yacht, strongly and publicly rejected this conclusion. Police questioned Guy Wallace extensively, but ultimately ruled him out of any wrongdoing. A suspect, however, did emerge. A 27-year-old man. One Scott Watson attended the New Year's Eve's party at Ferno Lodge. His boat, named Blade, had been built by Scott himself and was his pride and joy. Police seized his boat early on in the investigation um, on January 12th, and two days later, and two days later, the media had named him as the owner. Guy Wallace, the taxi driver, described the mystery man as European, around 30 years old. 5'10 and having a medium build. Now, Scott Watson was clean shaven and had short hair, and his boat only had one mast. Uh, something was a bit fishy here. When cases do not quickly resolve, criticism occurs. A woman who stated that she had heard screaming on the night of the party had never been interviewed, even though she reached out to the police. Another citizen, a man, states he supplied significant information in mid-January and did not receive a follow-up phone call for six weeks. Other witnesses reported that the police did not want to hear their sightings or information, and this is where controversy about the investigation ensues because People just think that the police were being lazy and that they were just kind of focused on one person. Perhaps under pressure and despite lack of evidence, the police arrested Scott Watson on June 15, 1998, nearly six months after the disappearance of Ben Smart and Olivia Hope. During the disposition hearing to determine if there was enough evidence to go to trial, some interesting evidence came to light. The prosecution argued that of the 1,500 to 2,000 people present at Marlboro Sounds on New Year's Eve, only Scott Watson's movements were not accounted for over a critical period that the pair went missing. Scott Watson repainted his blue boat on New Year's Day and cleaned the boat with the help of his sister thoroughly throughout, even down to the tape cases. There was no fingerprints found on the boat, and even places police would normally expect to find them. A blanket found on Scott Watson's boat has revealed two blonde hairs and three in a scrubbing brush. Uh, through forensic testing, they are 28,000 times more likely to have come from Olivia Hope or a maternal relative of hers. Other tests in Britain are still being done on the hair fibers during the time of the disposition. 176 scratch marks were also found on the underside of the boat's hatch cover, and these are believed to be fingernail scratches. Now, Scott Watson's legal team, the defense, argued a witness stated that he had heard Watson return to his boat on New Year's Day as he had to cross the Champion Way between the witness's boat and his. He heard no other people with him and no talking or disturbances. Another witness also said that she saw a blue and white catch with round portholes in Endeavor Inlet around 9 p.m. It had two masts and was close to 40 feet in length. 
Water taxi driver Guy Wallace also says that he delivered the pair, Ben and Olivia, to a large white and blue catch with two masks, a description that does not match Scott Watson's own boat blade, and that there was no direct identification with of Watson with Ben Smart and Olivia Hope. Nevertheless, the case goes to trial in 1999, and an 11-week trial where there are over 500 witnesses testify. The trial focused on the yacht that Ben and Olivia had allegedly boarded. The prosecution argued that the two boarded Watson's one-masted boat Blade, but other witnesses, including Guy Wallace, maintained that he had dropped the pair off on a two-masted catch. Olivia's father, who sat through the trial, saw much of the prosecution's case as, quote, pure theater. Nevertheless, the jury convicted Watson of their murders in May 1999, and the judge sentenced him to life imprisonment with a minimum non-parole period of 17 years. Now, I have read the affidavit of complaints by Scott Watson and his legal team, and all of them seemed totally grounded and legit to me. I see reasonable doubt in this case. Was Scott Watson a model citizen? No. But based on the evidence presented in court, I don't believe that there was enough evidence to convict him and reasonable doubt exists. In order to make a good case, you need to have circumstantial evidence, physical evidence. Now, the hair found on the blanket serves as the best evidence against him, but authorities only found this hair after the second search, and many believe that it could have been planted as evidence. Now, I think that's crazy, planting evidence, but you never know. And then, while also eyewitness accounts are often sketchy, two passengers and the water taxi driver state that the man in which the two victims left with was not Scott Watson. So, you have the physical evidence of the hairs, but you don't have any circumstantial evidence that Scott Watson left with Olivia Hope and Ben Smart. In the year 2000, appeal court judges decided that there was no new evidence exists to recommend a second trial. In November of that same year, a witness who testified at Watson's trial tells the New Zealand Herald that the evidence in court was nothing more than an act and that the police pressured him to testify. I mean, like, what? That is insane to me. In 2009, Watson petitioned the Governor General for a royal pardon to no avail. In June 2015, the parole board denies Watson a parole due to two failed drug tests and a psychological report that places him at a very high risk of committing violent acts if he was released. In 2016, the board denies him of parole again, and just this year, in June 2020, Justice Minister Andrew Little announced that the Governor General Dom Patsy Reddy has referred Watson's case back to the Court of Appeals. This will be the fourth time Watson and his legal team have challenged his convictions of the murder of Ben and Olivia. Now, this completes the 14th episode of the Crime Story Podcast. What do you think of this case? Do you think Scott Watson is guilty? Personally, I don't know if he is, but I do think there is reasonable doubt there. What do you think happened to Ben and Olivia? I would love to hear your thoughts. You can comment on a crime story Instagram at a crime story pod where I will be posting images from today's story. Or you can comment on a crime story podcast on Facebook or at a crime story pod on Twitter. And my website, a acrimestorypodcast.com, where you can listen to the podcast as well as read transcripts of today's story underneath the blog tab. Or even comment and see additional photos of a crime story podcast on YouTube. I have also started a TikTok under the name A Crime Story Podcast, so make sure to check it out. If you could please leave a review of the podcast, it helps others find it. Also, if you could tell a friend about a crime story, I would greatly appreciate it. I hope to see you next time on September 23rd, where I will be covering a insane case from Russia. You won't want to miss it. 
A Crime Story is hosted, created, written, and edited by me, Kaylin Lewis. Sources for today's episode can be found on my website, acrimestorypodcast.com. Theme music is by Ross Budgen, and additional story editing is brought to you by my father, Mike. Thank you so much for listening to A Crime Story, and remember to stay safe at home and abroad. Thank you.